This is a picture of Asia Pacific Theological Seminary. This is former, uh, this is land that was uh, in the hands of one of the major oil companies, Shell Oil. And um, it came into the hands of the Assemblies of God for a song. And, I mean, it was just an unbelievable miracle. All this land was donated. And some of the upper buildings, not the lower buildings, but upper buildings, uh, all, all came at an incredible price. It was an incredible deal because it just so happened that the address on the street was 444. And 444 is bad luck within the culture, and nobody wanted to buy a piece of property that had an address, 444. Be kind of like if you lived at 666. I mean, you know. So um, <clears throat> anyways, the land falls into the, into the hands of the seminary back in the early 90s, and the Lord has blessed with, with the buildings. You can see the development that they have. What you lose in this perspective is this looks like it's relatively flat. And you need to turn it at about 45 more degrees up like this because it is built literally into the face. It's built right into the face of the mountain. There was no place to run. I wanted to strap my shoes on and go run because it is, it is so incredibly steep and running up and running down. I tried a couple of times and I knew that I knew the legs weren't going to hold out. There's definitely no place to ride a bicycle and didn't have one while I was there, so I was left to walk around campus. But what an incredible gift the Lord has given to our theological seminary in the Philippines, and what a work, a wonderful work is going on there. Two of the mornings I was invited to speak to 17 leaders who were able to get visas, who came out of the underground house church movement in China. That is a movement that is measured conservatively now, conservatively at 100 million believers. Think of it. We think of China, and we've got all kinds of things that float through our minds economically and prophetically, and there, there's a whole bunch of stuff that, that right now, the, the important thing that we need to understand is right now there are 100, 000, or 100 million believers, the majority of which are spirit-filled in their theology and practice in China. And in many cases, they are facing ongoing and consistent persecution. Some of these leaders who came for the training were just such. Could someone get me a little bit of water? I overdid it when it comes to singing. Thank you, Pastor Troy. <clears throat> it was... Um, it was intimidating and humbling to stand before these leaders feeling really inadequate to impart anything to this blended group of young and old who have suffered greatly. Some of them have been imprisoned. All of them face suffering. Most of them have a very sure and certain outlook that at some point, if they are effective in ministry, they will be imprisoned for their faith. They don't treat it in a cavalier sense, but they live with that knowledge. There's a genuine humility among these dear brothers and sisters. In the class that I taught with an interpreter at the first two desks, they were student leaders from Beijing. In the next row, there was a discouraged pastor's wife who had obtained an, a visa to come to the training. Her husband, because of his activities, was denied a visa. And they decided among them that she would come and then take the training home to, uh, to her husband and to the home church there. But she was so incredibly um, discouraged. In the last row, quiet, very, very quiet, very reserved. A couple, it was hard to judge their age, an older couple, who I later found out after teaching for two days, I later found out are leaders of the fifth largest home church network in all of China, overseeing some five million souls. And they sat humbly on the back row, and they received, and they blessed, and they prayed, and they never made anything out of themselves. And I asked myself, who was I? And what could I impart? And the Lord, the Lord gave me liberty with a simple understanding. That God uses us, period, end of story. 
If we will make ourselves available, God uses us. He uses us in spite of us. He uses us not based on our learning, our knowledge, our wisdom. He uses us based on the moment and His Spirit. Thank you so much. And so I just blessed the Lord and waded into the teaching and the Lord gave us a great two days together, knit our hearts together. Our travel schedule turned our days and nights completely around. Twelve time zones are really tough on, on the body. You get confused with light and you get confused with rhythm. And It did offer the benefit of uh, being awake, wide awake, early in the morning. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning. It's a jet lag song. Early in the morning, <laughs> my song, it is, it's a jet lag praise. Uh, early in the morning, my song will rise to you. And I'd wake up every morning at 2.30 and 3, wide awake, ready to take on the day. Couldn't lay in bed any longer. And so I rolled out of bed and Lindsay wanted us to stay with her rather than in the guest quarters, which was great. Lindsay has an apartment that is large enough for 0.5 people. It's, it's really small. But she wanted us all together, so we were all crunched in there, and I'd roll out in the morning and, and before, uh, before the dawn, make a, a pot of coffee in her little apartment, and then step outside and go for a morning walk. And you could walk the perimeter of the property because there were stairs all the way up on the, on the borders and the perimeters, and walking up and around. I was walking for exercise and walking at the same time, praying and just asking the Lord's direction on the day. And if there's anything I'll miss about being in Baguio, it was those morning those morning walks, they have set high on the property, they have set this beautiful, beautiful promontory. They call it Prayer Mountain. And it's a high point on the campus, and the view is spectacular. And before dawn, I would climb up there, and I found it a wonderful place just to pray. You can see the little hut down there on the right side. There are, I believe, five little compartments in there, small little grottos, and the students sign up for and are, are assigned a key and those grottos are built so that the students can go there and they can pray all night and often some of students will be in there all night long and as you go up in the morning you'll hear someone calling out and praying and seeking God in the wee hours of the morning they are a prayer culture deeply dedicated to just seeking the Lord which is why their church is exploding all over, really all over Asia right now. And so I climbed up and looking for that place to pray. The night before, I guess it was Friday night, I shared concerning the power of song. And on a couple of occasions, I've taken you from, from Job 38 all the way through Revelation 15. We've tracked song all the way through the Bible and into eternity on both ends. Eternity before and eternity forever. We've looked at how music is consistent in all of that. And I unpacked those scriptures and challenged them concerning the glory and the power of the song. And that night we concluded the service with thunderous singing. It's just, it's amazing in the little chapel how they just raised the roof as they lifted their voices and they, they sang. Well, it was Saturday morning. I was out again early. And so I climbed up to take my place. And as I was climbing up to Prayer Mountain, I heard, I heard something and it stopped me in my tracks. And at first I, I couldn't see him. He was kind of obscured by, by a bush. And I moved to one side and I saw him. I saw him standing there at the edge of the precipice on Prayer Mountain. I could recognize from the profile one of my Chinese students who sat in the second row, who'd been there every day for the teaching, and I'd seen him also in the chapel services, and, and we talked a little bit through an interpreter, and there he was with his head tilted back. He had his iPad at his side and had a little bit of a soundtrack going with Chinese praise and worship music, and he was singing at the top of his lungs as the sun was coming up over this magnificent valley. Those are the clouds that you see down below him. And he was singing. He was singing. And he was praising the Lord. And I stopped for a moment. I was absolutely still. And I felt almost like I was violating the moment when I grabbed my iPhone and I said, I want a picture of that because the Lord spoke to me in that moment and a scripture came alive in me and I wanted to capture it. And in that moment, Psalm 57 came to mind, and you'll find the same words in Psalm 108. 
David writes and says, My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake, my glory. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations, for your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. And as I looked out at that young man standing at the edge of Prayer Mountain, singing with all of his might, those words resonated in my heart. I will awaken the dawn. I don't know what song he sang, except it was a song of praise. David gave us a song book, the Psalms. His 57th Psalm flows out of suffering and depression. It's one of the Psalms that David wrote in the cave when he was being pursued by Saul. And as later I was back in my room and had my Bible open and I was meditating on this 57th Psalm, I found myself tripping over the fact that David sang and prayed concerning God's glory over all the earth from a cave. David, David said that he would sing God's praises among the nations from a cave. Look at where he was. Look at his global vision. Look at his confidence in God being God over all circumstances and the universe and the nations. And look at David's incredible confidence in the greatness of God in a cave. Most of us have done some cave dwelling. Some of us literally. But most cave dwellers do not think or dream or sing with global aspirations. Most cave dwellers can only see their cave. Most cave dwellers don't concern themselves with much of anything beyond the cave except whoever it is that they're hiding from. Cave dwellers, when I speak of cave dwellers, I'm talking with people who live with a sense of trouble. People and trouble. Do you find those two go together? Have you discerned yet that life is hard? Is it just me? And that life has trouble? I don't know anybody who doesn't have trouble. I really don't. As a matter of fact, I look out and as I'm looking at your faces, those of you that I know and I've known at any kind of level for any amount of time, I know about trouble in your life somewhere. One place, one time, whether it was physical ailment or whether it was something that fell apart or whether it was a disastrous family life or, or whether it was drugs or a bottle or whatever. I, I look out, I see people who've had all kinds of trouble. I see people who have lost homes. I see people who couldn't get a job. I see people who just face trouble. Is there anyone here who can say, I've never had a bit of trouble. I don't know what in the world you're talking about. Every one of us knows what it is to live in a cave. Mike, you've lived in a few caves. Actually, you did live in caves in Afghanistan. Been there. You say, well, I was never in a situation like that. I'll bet your cave felt just as dark at times. I'll bet your cave might have been just as frightening, just as lonely. Cave dwellers. The thing about dwelling in a cave and living in the midst of your problems, when there is not this praise that takes us beyond them, the cave starts closing in on us. Trouble comes as a full-length mirror, a point of fixation. You get in trouble and you will begin to see yourself and you'll see yourself and your trouble magnified. Yourself, your trouble, will demand your full attention. Have you ever seen people in love with themselves in a mirror or in a plate glass window? How many of you look when you go past a plate glass window? How many of you look? Be honest. Come on. I do. I just want to make sure that my shirt is tucked in. I want to make sure that my hair is not out of place. I, I always... 
you know, I always look going, going past. I've got enough vanity, I guess. God help me, but no cause for, but I have it. And so, you know, I'll always, I'll always look. Trouble is that trouble draws us in. Before long with trouble, we're looking at a full length mirror and we are not in love with ourselves, but we are at times even horrified with ourselves, but we can't take our eyes off ourselves. That's what trouble is. It locks us into this cave, covers us up. That's David. His world was upside down. It wasn't working out like it was supposed to. He was God's man, but in Saul's disfavor, and therefore he was a fugitive. He was chosen by God, yet he was a target. He was righteous, and yet he was hunted. He was born for a throne, but he's living in a cave. He was commended for his bravery, and now he's condemned to hiding. We hear David's voice singing all the way through the Psalms, but we rarely consider where he was when he was singing. And Psalm 57 is a rare exception. We know that he was praising God for his deliverance from Saul in the caves. He was praising God and singing God's glory over all the earth when nothing had changed in his fugitive status nor in his personal circumstances. Nothing changed. Saul didn't say, come on home, everything's good, want you to move back into your bedroom. Give you my daughter back and everything's going to be great. As a matter of fact, we're going to set up a line of succession. That did not happen. David's circumstances were absolutely unmoved and unchanged. And yet in the midst of it all, David blesses the Lord. Praise comes easy with victory. But not so easy when it's just another day in the cave. And yet David writes, my heart is steadfast, O Lord. Some of your translations do a fairly good job with it when they say, my heart is fixed. It's fixed. Somehow David knew that the way out of the cave is found in the cave. That's something that's hard for us. We want God to spring us. We want to escape. We want to run away. We want to be done with it all. And what we don't understand is more often than not, the way out of the cave is found in the cave. The feet will never find the path if the heart is not true. The way out is found within in the condition of the heart. My heart is, he said, steadfast. Make this your goal. Establish this. This is the plan. This is the way that you'll walk. I will be in my heart in relationship with the Lord no matter what happens with my circumstances. I will be steadfast. Can I get an amen this morning? I will be steadfast. I will be immovable. I'll be unshakable. In my heart, I will be steadfast. Cave dwellers usually aren't steadfast. Cave dwellers get desperate. Cave dwellers get anxious. Cave dwellers get really defensive. Cave dwellers lose patience and they turn inward. They shrink to the size of their environment. Cave dwellers often will cancel their own dreams and all they see is their limitations. They resign themselves. But this cave dweller in Psalm 57, he's different. He breaks all convention. This cave dweller does not waver Rather, he stands strong. He doesn't curl up. He rises up early. This cave dweller doesn't point his finger and accuse God. He gives thanks. He praises. He doesn't sigh. He sings. His place in this world will not be limited by a cave or by his circumstances. He talks to himself. You'll find David often in the Scripture talking to himself. Some of you need to sit yourselves down and give yourself a good talking to. Just today, it would be a good thing. Just sit yourself down and, and talk to yourself. There's some things that you need to tell yourself. There's some things that you need to remind yourself. David's constantly talking to himself. You, you've heard him say, 
soul, my soul, magnify the Lord. He's talking to himself saying, I will, I'm going to magnify the Lord. And he reminds himself, David, <laughs> rather than looking at all your trouble here all the time, look at yourself in the mirror right now, David, and remind yourself you will bless the Lord at all times. Your praise, or your praise will continually be in, in your mouth. David says here in Psalm 57, awake, awake my glory. Good Hebrew translation there for glory is my whole being, the, co the complete package of who I am. Awake, my whole being, awake my glory. Awake, harp and lyre. And then he says it. I will awaken the dawn. David's saying, I'm going to get up and I'm going to sing to the dawning of a new day the praises of God even as I stand in the mouth of this cave, I will awaken the dawn with praise. This is key. David's prayers were bigger than his life. Ask yourself right now, are my prayers bigger than my life or are my prayers all about my life? Are my prayers reaching beyond my troubles, my problems, my challenges? Are my prayers beyond just what's going on in my family right now or the sickness that's in my body? Or are my prayers reaching beyond all of that? Or are my prayers defined by my life? I challenge you, check David out everywhere through the Psalms. You'll see it over and over. His prayers were always bigger than his life. And most of our prayers are not. Most of our prayers are captive to our circumstances. Most of our prayers are focused on either our glories or our trials or our hurts or our hopes or our disappointments or our complaints. And David's, David's prayer flowed out of praise. He praised a God who was so big, so great, so mighty, so powerful that the limitations of his cave lost their ability to limit him or to imprison him. The cave could not defeat David. The, the cave could not discourage him. The cave would not define him. His prayers were bigger than his circumstances. Look at it again. I'm going to sing, he says, among the nations, let your glory be over all the earth. Be exalted to the heavens. Do you see? David's praying was so much bigger than his problem. The cave became a nerve center for worldwide prayer and intercession. It was to the nations, to the clouds. It was to the heavens, over all the earth. The unlimited scope of David's praying. The Lord of all the earth. He's the Lord of all the earth. I saw that this week as we met with, well, they were from 12 nations, all together in one room just opened my eyes in a fresh and a wonderful way that he is the Lord of all the earth. His kingdom is not captive to any nation. He's not captive to any party. He's not hemmed in by any boundaries. How many of you know God is not an American? It's impossible to avoid this. Whatever we are and whoever we are, we cast God in the same light. White people see a white God. Black people see a black God. Our culture speaks to us, and before long, we take what we see and who we are, and we attribute that all to God, so we begin to view Him as though He's, well, He's Western. He's a Western God. He's an English-speaking God, too. That's the way we see Him. But he's not an American, nor is America his favorite. That can get me in trouble. I don't care. Our Judeo-Christian heritage does not secure us special indulgences. Obedience will always secure the blessing of the Lord. But our lofty church spires don't inspire his awe. They never did. And sadly, they don't inspire ours anymore either. The Tour de France has been on this week. How many of you are aware of that? Greatest sporting event of the year is on right now and you're watching? Yes, indeed. It's amazing. Yesterday was wonderful. What I like about the Tour de France is much of it is shot from a helicopter and they show you France and Europe and it is absolutely beautiful. And because they're proud of their history, they show you their churches. 
And so you'll see cathedral after cathedral after cathedral, and you'll see these, these lofty churches and these reaching spires, and, and they'll take you to the ruins of churches, and they'll explain all of that, and it's, it's absolutely, it's beautiful, and it's marvelous, and it means nothing to them anymore. It's a piece of history. It's a lesson to us. Whenever we look at those things and say, well, that glorifies God. Maybe it was built to glorify God, but somewhere along the way, it got drug into a cave somewhere. It didn't point to something bigger than it was. And so the church became possessed of her buildings. And as the church died, all that was left was her buildings. And that will happen here too. He's Lord of all the earth. The glories of His kingdom are perhaps more clearly seen in an impoverished little village church in, Indian, in Indonesia or in a persecuted underground church in China or on a pontoon Sunday school on the banks of the Zambezi than in the crowded and confused religious marketplace that's America. He's Lord of all of the earth. His kingdom is advancing over all of you. We are a small part of a global movement connected to a heavenly destiny. It's not about us. It's not about stuff. It's not about prosperity. It's not about comfort. It's not about power. It's about the glory of the Lord filling all of the earth. And that goes beyond all of our barriers and boundaries. And when the church is not filled with praise for the Lord of all the earth when we are not humming with prayer that reaches beyond our aches and our pains and our stuff, the church becomes truly powerless. A church in a cave. A church that's defined by us and our little lives. That church, without the song of praise, without a kingdom outlook, without concern for God's glory, takes on a cave mentality. It turns inward. We lose sight of the kingdom, we're left only with a cave. We lose sight of the world, we're left only with a shirking and a shrinking church. It's, an, it's a bit of an irony, isn't it? And I think it's been lost on us. In September, Reinhard Bonnke is coming here to Greensboro. He's a wonderful evangelist and he's coming called of God to preach the gospel message in this community. And we're part of, we're part of the team that's going to help roll people who don't know Jesus into that place. And we're going to see some wonderful things done. Has it been lost on us that the evangelist who's coming to our town to preach for a harvest of souls comes our way by Germany and Africa? This week I was convinced, absolutely convinced, of one thing in my heart, that the next great move of God in the world will almost certainly not originate in America. Were that it were not so, but that great wave, that next great wave of God's power just may flow out of China. Or it may ripple up out of South America. And we're not ready for that. Because we think we got it all so together. And who rises to awaken the dawn? Who's doing that among us? It wouldn't surprise me at all that God shocks us and turns our world upside down by using people we never would have imagined He would use for His purposes. Are we ready for that or are we too proud for that? Because really, friends, we, we keep our caves pretty well decorated up. They look pretty nice. We, we want our caves to be just as tasteful as we can make them. But do we see beyond our borders? Revelation 5.9 says, this song that is sung in Revelation in praise to Jesus says, they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. This week at APTS, students I preached to and taught were from China and Myanmar and Thailand and Japan and Philippines and Indonesia and Korea and Ghana, Fiji, Singapore, Malaysia, and a couple from the United States. And as I opened the Word, they opened my eyes a little bit wider to see the purity of their passion and the commitment of their prayer, their dependence on spiritual power, their world-changing potential, their kingdom priorities. Another point of view altogether. 
Don't get me wrong, I'm not ashamed of the American church and beating up the American church isn't going to do anybody good or accomplish anything good for the kingdom of God. I love the church. I'm not down on the church. I'm bullish on the church. I believe in the church. I believe what God has called us to do. I believe in His presence in this place. I believe that we are the blood-bought children of God and that He has united us together as part of the church. Don't think that I'm standing up here just to bash everything. It doesn't do any good. For those of you who are given to complaint. God bless your poor miserable soul. You need deliverance. So badly you need deliverance. The easiest thing in the world to do is complain. Nah. There's so much to thank God for. The Western missionary endeavors for the last 100 years have been so effective. It has been our century. Between England and the United States, it has been our century. We have changed the world with the gospel. Praise the Lord for it. Flourishing movements in other lands have been birthed or nurtured through missionary zeal in many cases of Western Pentecostals over the last four generations. We praise the Lord for that. But now our daughter churches all over the world are rising up and among them there is a passion a growing passion in their hearts to send missionaries to America think of it our sons and daughters sending missionaries to the nation God used in their birthing they're believing God for revival in our land you should have heard them praying last Friday night praying and pleading with God for America. It was deeply moving. It was humbling. It was challenging. And as I stood on the mountain there in Baguio and I listened to this young Chinese pastor as he was awakening the dawn with his singing, I, I think the Lord gave me a sense of our own spiritual poverty and a measure for riches that goes so far beyond dollars and buildings. Have you ever awakened the dawn? rolled out of bed and the first words on your lips were praise to the God who made you. Have you awakened the dawn where without a sense of embarrassment you lift your voice and you sing one of the songs of the redeemed? Have you ever, first thing in the morning, before your feet even hit the floor, have your thoughts been of Him? Is there any preoccupation in your life with Jesus? Is prayer a passion or is it just a courtesy at mealtime? Something perfunctory, something that you've memorized. If you found yourself ever praying over a meal and you didn't even engage your brain. You have a file there, you just push the button and it prays. And, and, you know, we've got a lot of them that we've learned. God is great, God is good, now we thank Him for the food. And we, always do, we almost do it with a cadence and... Or we kind of create our own, but it's always the same thing. And it doesn't engage the heart. Have you found that our prayers are sometimes by rote? I know just from people who struggle in, in prayer times, in a, in a prayer meeting. That time, they struggle to keep their mind on focus. They struggle to keep praying. Minds going off in, in all directions. Is prayer an ongoing conversation with a friend? Or is it a 911 call? Praying for many of us is, is nothing more than a 911 call. 911, what's your emergency? Lord? Well, I've got a lot of problems here today, Lord. I know I called you last week. I called you last week and I had a lot of problems last week, but I've got a lot more problems this week. And I'm going to tell you. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. Jesus is the burden bearer. He cares about all our problems. Yes, he does. But do you ever just call him up to praise him? Matter of fact, you'll find, you'll find you're not on the helpline all the time if you'll just learn to praise him. You'll find that your perspective will change completely. You'll find that the way that you view problems will change when you fill your life with praise. When you stop looking at God as just one who's going to drop a rope from heaven and pull you out, He's just going to rescue you in, in the last minute. If you would find Him in your circumstances and decide, I will bless the Lord at all times. Does the church 
program your praise. Is that it? Is this your praise this week? Sang, Pastor, with all my heart. Did no sweeter name. How can I keep from singing? Made me glad. How great is our God? And all those two hymns you threw in there. Sang every word. Got my praise on. I hate that saying. Oh, get your praise on. And it's just it's a personal thing. If it blesses you, it's just a me thing. Just, you know, get your forgiveness on there. And give me some grace. Get your grace on. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, oh, if you only knew what I didn't say sometimes. <laughs> but does the church program your praise? There it is. I praise the Lord this week. Man, I, I hope this is just a rehearsal of what you've been singing all week. And maybe you say, well, those aren't my songs. I hope you had 10 or 12 others. What are your greatest hits? What do you sing to the Lord? Can you name five of them right now? These are my songs. I sing these to the Lord all the time. We sang one of my top fives this morning. I sing all the time. I sing, He has made me glad. I love that. I, lo I will bless the Lord. Mm. I love that song. Then I got along. I won't go through my whole list. Do you have one? The songs that you sing from your heart. Is devotion something we expect of our biblical heroes but completely neglect in a personal application? Have you ever awakened the dawn? climbed up on to Prayer Mountain and slipped up behind that brother. I didn't want to scare him, so I made a little bit of noise and shuffled my feet, and he turned around. He smiled at me with a smile that would have just lit up your day. And we, I couldn't speak Chinese, and he couldn't speak English. But he was putting into practice the message from the night before, and he looked at me, and he did this. And he turned around, and he faced the clouds, and he just started to sing again. And I wanted to sit down and cry. So I thought, how often have I preached my heart out with no effect? With no result? For David... God was not an afterthought. He was the first light of every morning. I know, I hear you. Life is too busy and it's hectic. It is, I know. Sometimes we know we should be living holy lives and we find ourselves living haggard lives. We're stressed. Because we're stressed, we're drugged. Because we're stressed and drugged, we're hurried and frazzled. And who has time to be proactive in such a reactive world? We live our lives at times, all we do is run around putting out fires. You say, you want, me to, you want me to plan my day like you think I've got any control over them? I wake up in the morning and somebody's ringing a fire alarm and if I don't put out the fire, the kids aren't going to... And then it's one thing to the next to the next. I live my life in reactionary mode and I'm saying, brothers and sisters, we have to take control of our lives that the first words that pass from our lips in the morning are praise to the God who made us. The first thing we do is glorify Him and exalt Him and lift Him up. And life is busy. You say, who has time to pray? I know we wouldn't dare say that, but we do. Who has time to pray? I mean, it, leave, it would leave so little time for television. Or Facebook. Or recreation. Or making money. Or family. Family's the trump card we always play. Can't tell you how many people say, I, I have no time for the kingdom of God because of my family. If you bring your family into the work of the kingdom of God, you'll find you always got time because they're always there with you. I know, it's convicting, I'll just leave it alone. But our dance cards are full. And that's our problem. Our priorities are miscast. That's our problem. 
The idea of awakening the dawn, foreign. It would be ludicrous to suggest that life has just become too busy for eating, wouldn't it? If I were to make the case this morning, you know, we all need to just stop eating because the demands of life are just too great. That time we spend eating, we could spend, I mean, there's a whole bunch of things. We could make sure that we got everyone to where they needed to be on time and we'd be able to just think of what, what we would be able to, go. we'd get a couple hours, two more hours out of the day if we just weren't eating. Oh, by the way, food preparation Food preparation, if we could get that out, of, you know, that, that would go too. So maybe we get three extra hours a day. You stop and think about the efficiency if we could just, it's ludicrous, I know, but just think if we could stop eating. I mean, it would be a great thing, wouldn't it? What would happen if we stopped eating? The body would suffer. It would suffer emaciation, and the body would quickly die. Because we're talking about a physical reality here, aren't we? You've got to eat. It's, some of you right now, your stomachs are growling. You're wondering, is he going to be done anytime soon? Because the Baptists have already beaten us to line at the cafeteria. Yeah. We know the Presbyterians were there much earlier. And so, will there be anything left for us? And I'd describe for you, you know, some of you already have in your mind right now what you're having for lunch. You already know. A few of you, it was on the stove when you left the house. And if you just stop and think about it for a moment, you can smell it. Boy, that's going to be good. And there's a group of you, and you can't figure it. You'll go out of this place, and the, the great crisis of your day is going to be you and your wife saying, where do you want to go? I don't know. Where do you want to go? I don't know. Where do you want to go? Well, do you want to go there? No, I don't want to go there. Well, why didn't you say so? Would you pick it? No, I want you to pick it. No, I don't want to pick it. What do you think? No, I'm not. <laughs> you there? You there? Welcome to our world. So, you know, it's all about eating, right? We eat. Why? Well, we need to, aside from the fact that for some people it's one of the few joys they experience in life. It's, it's part of our obesity it's part of our obesity crisis that we feel the only time some people really feel love and acceptance is through food. I'm not saying that it is anything but social commentary. It's where we live. We, we fight it, we, but it's there. And it would be ludicrous for me to say, you know, we could get more time out of the day if we just stop eating. But does life touch only the physical realm? What of the spirit? How's the spirit nourished? It's nourished by relationship with God and by feeding on His Word. Is the spirit being nourished? Wouldn't it be just as ludicrous to suggest that life was just too busy for prayer? After all, without spiritual nourishment, the spirit suffers emaciation and moves towards death and burial. <laughs> in a cave that contains us and defines us and destroys us. David could have crawled ever deeper into his cave, tired of being hunted, tired of running, tired of his increasing responsibilities. The Lord was sending him all of these people, but they weren't blue chippers. And that can get frustrating. I mean, David wants to be right, and he wants to do right before God, and he wants to be used of the Lord, and the Lord's sending him the dregs. The Bible says that sent to David were those who were in debt, those who were discontented, those who were discouraged. I mean, these, these people all were downers with problems with the IRS. These are the people that David has to take responsibility. It would have been really easy for David to crawl into the cave and say, it's just too much. It would have been easy for David to say, you know, my disappointments have been too many. I'm disappointed in the way that things have worked out. I'm disillusioned by the constant delays. I thought by now I'd be the king. I'd be seated on the throne. 
but nothing's moving and nothing's changing. But no, here we find a man who has found himself and given himself to worshiping a God who is bigger than his life. And that worship led him out of the caves and into the kingdom, and it set him as a forerunner for the Son of God who came to redeem men and women from every nation. So this morning, I'm not suggesting five easy steps to get out of your cave. I'm not suggesting even that you leave your cave. Don't you leave a moment before you find God there. In the midst of your trouble, learn to praise Him. In your broken, in your broken circumstances, glorify His name. Be steadfast. Let your heart be fixed. Let Him, in the midst of the struggle, shape you. Shape you for a destiny that is bigger than you are. Rise up in the morning and give Him praise. Do whatever you have to do to remind yourself. But make Him first. Set your path to glorify Him. Look beyond yourself. Pray great prayers. Prayers that cause you to look beyond yourself. Pray great prayers about the nations and to the heavens and over all the earth. Pray great, expansive prayers. Pray for whole nations. Why not you? Set your eyes on something that is so much bigger than you are. And He'll come and inhabit your praise and change your life doesn't mean that tomorrow you'll be out of that cave. It doesn't mean that tomorrow all your problems will go away. It doesn't mean that tomorrow your circumstances are all going to shift. It doesn't mean that if you'll just send your love gift to this ministry, God is going to bless you. You can't buy this. No. It means that in the midst of it all, you discover the greatness of God. And that changes, that changes even from the inside of a cave. And so I want you to stand with me. And I want you to sing it again. And if God has spoken to your heart, if I've missed the target completely this morning, and it, it can certainly happen, but God has spoken to your heart, about becoming a man or a woman of praise. Why don't you make this your commitment? Why don't you make this your pledge? Why don't you give yourself to Him afresh and anew? You say, oh, i got so much i got to make right. i got so much i got to clean up. Lay it all out before the Lord. But begin, begin even now with the resolve to glorify Him and sing this with me. I will awaken the dawn. If that's the pledge, if that's what God has put in your heart this morning, just lift your hand to heaven and just tell Him right now, I will awaken the dawn. I will become a person who prays on a different level, not just about my need and my problem. I am going to bless you, Lord. I will establish a foundation of prayer in my life and praise in my life that begins with your greatness and your goodness. I will cease to call you only when I have a problem and I will begin to call on the name of the Lord every day of my life. I will invest my circumstances and my problems with praise. I will cover these things with your mercies and your grace. I will remind myself of 
of your goodness all the day long. I will memorize the scripture and I will sing it and speak it over my life. I will nourish my spirit by standing before you in prayer and opening your word. I will awaken the dawn. I will become one who is bigger than my life because of your greatness and your goodness. I will sing to you, O Lord. I'll sing to you, O Lord. I'll sing to you, O Lord. Holy Lord. Holy Lord. Holy Lord. Bless you, Jesus. Would you just begin all over this place just to praise him? It's not about us now. It's unto Him. Praise all over this place. Just begin to praise Him. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. You are awesome and mighty. You are great in power. You're my answer and my help. You're my healer and my hope. You are all that the Word of God says that you are. You are the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. You are my all-sufficient one. You are my healer. You are the soon coming king. You are the king of all of the universe. You rule and you reign forever and ever. There is none that can match you in power and might. You and the devil are not equals. <laughs> you are not equals. You have overcome. You are mighty and you are powerful and you are God over my life. I bless you and I praise you for you are Lord above all of the nations and to the heavens we lift up praise and we pray over all of the earth. Let mighty revival break out. Let your spirit, O Lord, go forth in power. In these days, let the testimony of Jesus once again shake the foundations of the earth. Give us, I pray, a harvest of souls like we have never known before. We plead with you. We cry out to you, O Lord, for the work of your kingdom to be accomplished in us and through us. Hallelujah. 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 We bless you and we praise you. Will you sing to the dawn tomorrow? Will you do whatever it takes? Write it on your mirror if you have to. Do whatever it takes to remind yourself that you will awaken the dawn with praise and thanksgiving and blessing the name of the Lord. And when you've wrapped Monday, Tuesday, will you awaken the dawn with praise? Will you establish a new pattern in your life of praise? You will never be the same.